going to see myself out of the corner of my eye. There we go. Hi, Internet. Uh, let, let's do this. Can I do this? Can I, can I, oh, I can't flip once I started recording. Well, I just do this. There we go. You, you at home, you are missed, and we look forward to the day when you will be with us again. All right. We are doing our Tabernacle series. I hope you've been uh, following on the videos uh, with us. And this is something that God uh, is doing. I, I don't have to uh, pump you up. I don't have to convince you. This is a year of freedom. And the environment and the circumstances are around us just confirm it to me. It just makes me know without a shadow of a doubt that this is the word of God. And that God desires to lead his people to freedom. And so this morning we're going to continue this, this tabernacle series. And, and really with the whole um, Black Lives Matter movement and question of equality and, and people fighting for rights that they should fight for. The question is, freedom for what? And what kind of freedom are we looking for? And if God is promising us freedom, well, what is his promise of freedom? What is he offering us? And so this morning, I want, to con I want us to continue this series. And um, I need to ask you all, if I say hashtag, what does that mean to you? If I say the word hashtag, now the younger generation are smiling. I saw some of the older generation smiling. I saw some nervousness on certain faces because they're like, what is it supposed to mean? Uh, so, uh, Daniel, you're Mr. Mr. Culture. Uh, what's hashtag? What does it mean? How many understood nothing of what he just said? No, it's not that your explanation is wrong. It's just without the context, we still maybe don't understand this. Well, the reason I ask is this morning's uh, sermon is called Hashtag Relationship Goals. H hashtag Relationship Goals. Now, I actually did a little bit of research. The hashtag evolution is quite intriguing. It was Bell that started it off in the 60s. As they were planning their touch-tone technology, they did market research. This is to show you how deep market research goes. They did market research to find out which two um, symbols would be the most appealing on their phone. And what came back was the asterisk and the number sign. Those were the two symbols that came back as being the most appealing uh, symbols. And so Bell introduce those to their touchtone phone. And then with the arrival of automated phone services where you could put in numbers, they would always say end with the hashtag, because the number sign, because or the pound key. We'll talk about that in a second. But you would press the number sign as a signal to the computer that the information that you just entered was to be stored separately. And so the, this number sign um, tone marked this content as being sanctified, as being separate. And that was the bell um, introduction of the quote-unquote hashtag, the number sign. Now, how did the number sign come to become, come to become, no, come to be the pound key? Because that's what it's, you, we, Liam and Lucas won't know this, but because but, there it's hashtag. It's the hashtag for them. But for most of us, it's the pound key, right? How did that happen? Um, that history is a little uncertain. Some people think because on the typewriter, on top of the number three was the British currency symbol on the original typewriters. And so when they introduced the hashtag, the number sign, they put it in that place. And so people still called it the pound key for the British uh, currency. So I thought that was interesting. But there's another possible reason, and that was when people would type, putting the number one and then putting L 
B for pound was confusing on the typewriter. And so people replaced the, the LB for pound with the number sign when they would type. So it became a typing habit. If you wanted to say one pound, you would put one number sign. So choose whichever origin story you like the best. I like the British currency one myself, but then uh, the internet was going long before we knew about it. I don't know if you knew that or not. Um, the internet was up and running in the 80s before any of us had AOL. Um, and they had something called the IRC, the Internet uh, Relay Chat. And on the Internet Relay Chat, they used the number sign the same way the touchtone phones did. Anytime they wanted to send coded information uh, via the IRC, they put the pound sign, the number sign before. And so it signified a, a special sanctified piece of information. Then fast forward to 2007, the lovely Twitter par, uh, platform, and what was his name? I, got, I wrote it down. Chris Messina. Chris Messina was the very first guy to recommend on Twitter using the hashtag symbol to put aside a conversation as being separate, as being special. And then the piece de resistance was in 2008 when Obama was running for president. He used it. He said, hashtag ask Obama. And you could tag anything and ask him questions. And he answered. And that's really one of the reasons, one of the reasons he became president. And so the hashtag, the rest is history. Now, what on earth does this have to do with uh, us today and in, in our series on the Tabernacle series? Well, the hashtag relationship goals became a really popular hashtag on Twitter. Anytime somebody put a picture of them doing something nice with their spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend, people would take that and say, relationship goals. I want a relationship like that. Do you know this morning that God wants a relationship with us? Amen. Now you're trained to answer yes, but I want you to think about what that means. The fact that God wants a relationship. I don't know if you're in your perfect relationship or if you're still waiting for that perfect relationship or uh, if you're in the fiance, in the honeymoon phase. <laughs> uh, I don't know where you're at or maybe yesteryear you had the perfect relationship and, and that's gone. I don't know. We're all in different stages. But we should all be able to understand that we have relationship goals or we have had relationship goals. God has relationship goals for us today he does it's not just about him doing these big universal plans these big movements in the universe or on the planet he he moves things in our lives so that we will draw closer to him and that we will not just draw closer to him so we can sing louder or cry more often or or read a verse and it touch us more deeply he, he moves our lives in a way that we would start to go closer to him so that he can draw closer to us. That's what the Bible says. Draw close to God and he will draw close to you. And, and, and the goal when he draws close, closer to us is to, yes, have intimate moments with us, but to cause the uh, growth and maturity that needs to happen in our lives. He, he wants to be the orchestrator of that. I thank God that he inspires our messages. I thank God that he inspires our worship. I thank God that he inspires other people out there to write books and publish material and post things that can, can encourage us to get closer to him. But the only way to truly, truly grow in our relationship with God is by being with God himself. Now, as simple as that is to say... If we're being honest, we don't always do it that way. We draw closer to God via somebody else. We listen to the worship song. We listen to the sermon. We read the book. We read the Bible passage. And again, those things are fine as long as they bring us to the place of being face-to-face -face with Him. And if we don't get there, we're falling short of God's relationship goals. We are uh, looking at the children of Israel just in case you haven't seen any of the videos, I've said this basically at the start of every single video, we are looking at the children of Israel as a model 
of people being led to freedom. Now, I'm totally aware that they never got there, but that doesn't change that it was God's goal to free them and to liberate them. And I believe that God has inspired us to look at their story, at their uh, circumstances as a model that we can emulate today, seeking our own freedom. Freedom from sins, freedom from uh, mental uh, traps, mental prisons that we're in, and even freedom from physical bondages that we're in. And so we're going to continue in that light today. All right, Galatians 3.17. If you have a Bible, uh, you can look at this with me. Kind of an obscure passage for our, our, our main verse today, but Galatians 3.17 says, what, am I, what I am saying is this. The law that came 430 years later does not cancel a covenant previously ratified by God so as to invalidate the promise. I'll say that again because it's very obscure and I'm reading it out of context. What I am saying is this. The law that came 430 years later does not count, cancel a covenant previously ratified by God so as to invalidate the promise. What he's saying is that the law of Moses that came to Israel did not invalidate the covenant with Abraham. So what does that mean for us? How can we get excited about this? Because it sounds like boring Bible history. We should be very excited by this because everything that happened to Israel in the wilderness was to validate the relationship that God had started with Abraham. Everything that happened in the wilderness with the children of Israel, including what we spoke about in last week's video, about the terrible God and his forgiveness, all of these events, they were not just to highlight Israel and what Israel was going through, which, as I said, already ended in failure, seemingly. Everything that happened to them was to ratify that means to make real, to bring the covenant promise to Abraham, God was bringing it to his people. That's what he was desiring to do. That was his relationship goal. The promise that he had given to one man, his desire was to give to everybody. And the promise that we see fulfilled in Jesus Christ, which is the promise of Abraham to his seed, God is still doing the same thing today in 2020. God is still doing this today. As I've been studying the Old Testament and reading through it, I realize that I've been guilty. I confess I've been guilty at times of seeing the Old Testament God versus the New Testament God. I, I've done it. I can talk about other people doing it, but, but I've done it. In my heart, I'll read about God doing something, and I'll be like, wow, that Old Testament God, he was scary. The truth is this. There is no Old Testament God and New Testament God. They're the same. They're one and the same. Jesus Christ did not only come on earth 2,000 years ago. As scary or weird as this might sound. Jesus is all through the Old Testament. Maybe his name isn't Jesus. Maybe his body isn't the body that walked the earth 2,000 years ago. But the Spirit of God was moving with Abraham, with Joseph, with Moses, with Malachi, with Isaiah, with Mary, with Zerubbabel, with all of them. The Spirit of God, Jesus, the heart of God, the love of God was there making a difference in lives. And we are still under this same covenant today. The blood of Jesus affords us awesome privileges, amazing access that is special and unique and worthy to be studied. But as we read the Old Testament, we have to understand there is no disconnect. It is all part of the process of God liberating people, bringing them to his relationship goals. And so they serve as a model for us today. And so for today, very briefly, I promised in the video we would be brief and we will be brief. I want to look at walking in the Spirit as part of our freedom lifestyle. We need to walk in the Spirit. So what on earth is this? I mean, number one, uh, 
Everybody know how to walk? I mean, just humor me for a second. Just want to make sure. How do we walk? Because of social distancing, I won't ask for somebody to do it. But, but could you please just somebody volunteer a very basic explanation of how do we walk? Put one foot in front of the other. And do it again and again and again. But what's going to happen? I, I need to do something else, right? You're, you're perfectly correct. But then what else do I need to do? Watch where I'm going. Steer. Have a, a, a direction. Have a goal. Have a, an arrival point. Right? How do we walk in the spirit? Oh, you're getting too theological on me. You're supposed to say exactly the same way. One step after the other, steering, watching where you're going, and having a goal. That's what it is when Paul says it. Galatians 5, do you want to read it? Let's look at it together. Galatians 5, 16. In the New King James Version, he says, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the desires of of the flesh. Walk in the spirit and you won't manifest the goals of the flesh. The direction, the steps that your flesh wants to take you, you won't do those if you walk in the spirit. The uh, NET Bible, instead of saying walk in the spirit, it says live in the spirit. Because the translators understood that Paul was using an analogy when he said to walk in the Spirit. He was using a metaphor. You don't literally walk in the Spirit. You don't. Literally. It's, it's, it's a way of living. And the Israelites modeled this. The children of Israel modeled this in Exodus 40. If you could turn to Exodus 40 with me, please. In verses 34 to 38, it says, everybody on the internet doing okay? It's not live, it's being recorded, but still, they'll be watching it live, right? You always watch something live. In Exodus 40, verse 34, it says, the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. But when the cloud was lifted up from the tabernacle, the Israelites would set out on all their journeys. But if the cloud was not lifted up, then they would not journey further until the day it was lifted up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, but fire would be on it at night in plain view of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. This was for 40 years. 40 years. We've been in quarantine for three months and two weeks. This was 40 years that they lived this way. 40 years of waiting for the Spirit of God to move. And only when the Spirit moved did they move. Literally. They had a camp. They, they put down their tent pegs. They had watering holes. They collected their manna. They, they stored things in jars. They did commercial exchanges. They lived life. They did a 24-7 a life. And it was all centered around the Spirit of God. Literally, they camped in a formation around the tabernacle. And the Spirit would hover over the tabernacle and permeate it. And only when the Spirit moved. I hope you're seeing this. I hope you're understanding as I'm explaining this. This is a beautiful picture of what God's relationship goals for us today is. But so many of us live short of this. So many of us don't pay attention to the Spirit of God. Or very rarely. We will when a pastor is preaching or someone's prophesying. Or maybe as the worship song moves us. Then we'll pay attention. Somebody shares the, the, the daily bread with us or po posts a Bible verse, then we'll pay attention. And so we should. 
But this model is so much deeper than that. This was for 40 years. Daily, they had to keep their eyes focused on the Spirit of God. And it was a pattern, it was a model of how God wants to lead His people. And the ultimate question is, do we want to be led that way? Do we want to be led that way? This is where it's so easy to say, yeah, but Jamie, that's the Old Testament. Paul, in Galatians chapter 2, verses 8, 19 and 20 says, For through the law I died to the law, so that I may live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So the life I now live in the body, I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. The problem with these verses is we've read them so many times. We've heard them in so many sermons. Just like Daniel's explanation of the hashtag, we don't actually understand it. We understand the words that are spoken, but we don't understand how that applies to our lives. I have died to the law so that Christ may live in me. What on earth does that mean to us in 2020? I'm going to tell you it means everything. It should mean everything. Do you know that Moses went up to see the Lord on top of the mountain at least eight times? That's not in the movie, is it? That's not in our Sunday school memories, is it? At least eight times he was called up and sent back. And many of those times it was because of the actions of the people. When Jethro watched him judging the people, he said, this is not good. You're going to kill yourself because daily hundreds, if not thousands of people were lining up to see Moses and to ask for a judgment on their lives. So that would be, hey, my wife said this to me, what should I do? Hey, my neighbor did this to my mule, what should I do? Hey, I've got all this grain. I don't know what to do. This was the law. It's not just the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. For 40 years, this went on, where they went to see Moses. Moses would listen to the Lord and then give the decision. Haven't you ever wondered why Exodus 25 to 40 is all these laws? And then Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy? It's because it wasn't on one afternoon. It wasn't just the day they got to Sinai. For 40 years, they were getting rules from God on how to live. And so when we say that we die to the law, we're not saying that we're dying to 10 phrases on stone tablets. We're saying that we're dying to this lifestyle. We're dying to this sort of living where we're like, we don't actually know how to put one foot in front of the other. We're not living free. We're living terrified. What if I do this and this happens? What if I go here and this happens? And Paul says, I'm done to that. I die to that. And the life I now live, I live to Jesus Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. I'm a tabernacle. I'm I'm a container of the Spirit of God. The same way Jesus walked the earth filled with the Spirit of God, God wants His people to be exactly the same today. We scratch our heads and say, how is this possible? We say, oh, they lived in a different culture. I can't do that today. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. It won't look the same because we're not wearing the robes and going to the marketplace and getting our well from a water. But we're still going to the marketplace, we're still getting our water, and we're still interacting with our neighbors. And so it is meant to look the same. God's relationship goals have not changed. He's looking for people who will walk by the Spirit. And these are people that are not just titulated in a worship service to prophesy or raise their hands. These are people who will look at their bodies as temples of the Holy Spirit. These are people who will look at their daily exchanges with other people as an opportunity to share the oracles of God. These are people who wake up in the morning thrilled to meet with their God, where it's not a chore 
to read the Bible or pray a little bit more, but an expression of the relationship of love that's already there. Now, I close by saying all of this is meant to be said without guilt. Because the truth is, I doubt any of us are there, at least 24-7 there. I say it this morning with God's heart that this is an invitation. That this is an invitation to join into this tabernacle experience. And I close with Exodus 19 where God says this. This is at the very beginning when they arrive at the base of Sinai in Exodus 19, verse 4, Moses says, well, God says through Moses, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I lifted you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And now, if you will diligently listen to me and keep my covenant, then you will be my special possession out of all the nations. For all the earth is mine, and you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you will speak to the Israelites. You will be a special possession. That word means property. Stupid question. What do you do with a property? You live in it. Well, you build in it, but then you live in it. You got yourself a new apartment, or somebody has a new apartment, you got a new apartment to live in, right? That's the goal. When God says, I want you to be my special possession, he's saying, I want you to be my special property. That's what it is. That's the invitation. If you will listen, if you will listen and keep, listen and keep, obey and walk. Obey and live. If you will listen and keep, then I will call you my special property where I will live, where I will delight to put my name and my presence. I'll be all over you. And Jesus repeats this in the upper room. If you love me and obey me, my Father and I will come in and we will dwell with you. You will be a habitation for us. Paul and us, we will say together, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is not just a nice phrase to say. This is a living reality that God wants us to experience. This is his relationship goal. Hashtag God's relationship goals. Amen? Amen. Father, I just ask now that you would cause your word to find root and Lord, that we would uh, clean up house, that we would make room, and that we would go to the extreme that Paul said, that we would crucify the flesh with all of its desires, all those things that oppose your holiness in us, and that we would become truly that, that glorified vessel that we read about, the new wineskin that we re read about, all these metaphors that the writers used. Lord, we want to live it. We want to experience it in 2020. We want to live it as a church and as individuals. I pray you do this now in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.